Can a proposition be true and false at the same time? Is there any way to make sense of a true contradiction? If our logic is inconsistent, does that mean it's incorrect? These are the questions we're addressing in the 42nd episode of Patterson in Pursuit. Hello, my friends. This is another episode where I get to talk about my favorite topic in the world, logic. And I got a pretty awesome story to tell you, too. So usually when I do interviews with people, it'll be in their office, usually some small place at a university. Occasionally, I've met in some professor's homes. But this episode, I got an awesome change of pace. It just so happened to work out that because I'm in New Zealand, where they're celebrating summer, the professor I emailed happened to be out of his office and house-sitting for one of his family members. And that family member happened to live in a gorgeous part of New Zealand on a mansion on a farm. So my guest, Dr. Patrick Girard, kindly invited me and my wife out to this beautiful mansion on a farm. It was definitely by far the coolest environmental setting that I've been in for any one of these interviews. And in fact, you'll hear in this interview, there's birds chirping in the background. And that's because where we conducted this interview was kind of this gazebo type covered area that was letting some bird sounds in. So a special shout out to Dr. Gerard for his hospitality. My wife and I had a blast and it was a fantastic conversation. So if you guys aren't familiar with the relationship between mathematics and logic, there might be some parts of this interview that seem a bit advanced, but don't be intimidated. You can follow along, you can Google. If you're interested in these kind of topics, it just takes a little bit of research to see maybe a little bit of the history and context for this connection between math and logic. And also, if you're interested, if you haven't picked up a copy yet of my book on logic, you can pick one up on Amazon. You can get a paperback version for $9.99. It's called Square One. The Foundations of Knowledge, and it is exactly about the topics that we're going to be talking about in this episode. And if you're new to the podcast, you might be thinking, who is this Steve Patterson guy who's written a book on logic and he doesn't even have a PhD in philosophy? Who does he think he is? Well, I'm happy to say that the world of ideas is being revolutionized by the internet, just like virtually every other industry. And if you want to be a part of that, the sponsor for this show is a company called Praxis, which I've spoken about before. I'm a huge fan of this company, and they recognize that the college degree nowadays doesn't mean what it used to mean. It doesn't mean you're guaranteed a good job. doesn't mean that you're even necessarily educated. In some circumstances, it might mean that you're a bit anti-educated, depending on what you studied in college and where you went. So Praxis is a company that takes young people that are dissatisfied with their college experience or want to avoid college altogether, and they place them into the real world. They give them a six-month paid apprenticeship and three months of a professional boot camp. And once you complete their program, they contractually guarantee you a job offer. Now, you don't get that in college, but you can get that with the Praxis program. They, like myself, are on the cutting edge of the post-academia workplace. So if that sounds like something you're interested in, go to discoverpraxis.com, check out the program, schedule a call with them, and see if it would work for you. So my guest today, Dr. Patrick Girard, teaches philosophy at the University of Auckland. He specializes in various areas of logic, and he's written on paraconsistent logic, which is an idea that in some limited circumstances you can have true and false propositions, but maybe that's not as big a deal as somebody like myself would claim that it is. Our discussion begins with fundamental questions about the nature of truth, and then it doesn't take long before we transition to talking about logic. Enjoy. So first of all, thank you very much for inviting me to this beautiful location, uh, and we're going to have a great conversation on philosophy, and it's so scenic, uh, it's, it's almost surreal. <laughs> it is a pretty beautiful spot. Thanks for having me for the interview. Yeah. Actually. So where I want to start with you is basic questions about truth. And we have kind of intuitive notions about truth and about logic and about holding our beliefs in a consistent manner. But before we dive into any detail, I want to ask a very basic question. What is truth? When we say that word, I want to know what the truth is. What does that word mean, truth? That's a big question. 
<laughs> start with a bang. <laughs> um, I mean, yes, we are interested in truth, and as seeking beliefs, we want to acquire true beliefs and false beliefs, and we have to know a little about what truth is, but if we get too much in the details of truth, then we'll never get out of it, because of course philosophers have been asking about what truth is for centuries, and it is its own topic, mm -hmm. and it's a gino it's ginormous subject. Uh, and so, yes, you need to know a little about truth, but you don't want to get stuck too much, probably, in what truth is if you're in a truth-seeking activity. Right. Just like a gold digger, you don't need to know all the details of the chemistry about gold to go and find gold in the world, right. I suppose. Okay. Right? I think one thing that is important about truth is at least to realize what kind of things can be true or false. Okay. There is an intuitive notion, I suppose, that um, you know, we can express it by saying something like everything is either true or false, right? But what's everything? Okay. Right? The everything here, it, it can't be everything, everything, right? If I say New Zealand is true, <laughs> right? That makes no sense, right? Okay. So, so, so something like New Zealand is not the kind of thing that can be true or false. Okay. okay? So this has some kind of connection with propositions. Propositions, yes. So propositions would be what philosophers take to be the kind of things that are true or false. And mm -hmm. when we say everything is true or false, we'll eventually um, identify everything means every proposition is the kind of things that are okay. true or false. So a proposition could be something like the only native mam mammals in New Zealand are bats. Mm -hmm. So that is a sentence that I've expressed in words, and that's the kind of thing that can be true or false, mm -hmm. right? So what a proposition is, again, is a big... Uh, subject in philosophy, okay. uh, what, perhaps one good way to start thinking about it is to think about language and sentences, right? Mm -hmm. So if I say like New Zealand, the only native new mammals in New Zealand are bats, I'm using a sentence here and I could say of that sentence that it is true or false because it says something that corresponds to sort of the reality about New Zealand. Okay. Right? So that's that second part. The correspondence to the reality. Yeah. Okay, okay, so <laughs> I'm not an expert on, on, on the various kind of ways. Um, but what matters here is more that it is the truth is ascribed to the sentence. I think that's right. what I would like to focus on just okay. now, right? Yeah. And okay, so then does that mean that every sentence is true or false? You know, if you think about questions, for instance, like if I ask you, would you like a coffee? And you answer it false. That doesn't seem to match, right? What time is it? What, what time is it? <laughs> Good morning. Shut right. the door. Right. Right. So there's various bits of, of language that we use that are not meant to be truthy. Okay. Right. So if you're in a language, you want to isolate the, the sentences that are the kind of things that are true or false. Okay. And logicians, for instance, have tried to devise very artificial kind of languages. You can, you know, they develop some kind of mathematical languages that are meant to only talk about prepositions, so everything that, that ev every sentence that you can construct grammatically in those kind of languages are the kind of things that are true or false, okay. right? So then you can start analyzing the logic and then you've isolated what counts as being true or false. Okay, so when you say something like, um, you know, shut the door, you say that's not really true or false, it communicates some some meaning, those words have meaning, but it's not really a statement about reality. It's not really claiming something is or isn't the case, right? That's right, that's right. Okay, so when we say something is the case, let's say, you know, it is true that there are, you know, it is partly cloudy today. We're making a statement about reality. We're saying that as a true statement. <clears throat> Does that mean that truth has this necessary uh, always connection with reality, that you cannot have truth if it's somehow detached from reality. That, that, that's wrapped into the definition of truth is statements about reality. What about mathematical truth? Well, what about mathematical truth? Well, I suppose it depends on your commitment as to whether mathematical is part of reality or mm -hmm. not, right? And that, again, is a big question, of okay. course, but What's the reality of numbers? Are numbers and the operation of additions and subtraction and is zero part of reality? That's a big controversial question. Okay. So you but could independent yeah. of that question, there's still 
I think 2 plus 2 equals 4 will come out true regardless, right? Would we use that term? So could we say 2 plus 2 equals 4 is something like valid or... or and I like the idea of calling it true. I think it's true to say mathematics is part of reality. I think we can, I think we can justify that. But could we explore... Could it, you're saying that it could be the case that some, some kind of claim could be true and not state anything about reality. Presume, uh, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm happy with that. Okay. At least mathematical claims. Okay. Uh, there are claims that we can probably come to know to be true without knowing all that much about reality. Okay. Logical truth, for instance. You know, everything is true or false. Every proposition is true or false. Okay, so but. maybe, and we won't go down this rabbit hole, but maybe it has to do with what we mean by reality. <laughs> sure, yeah. <laughs> Which is uh, obviously a difficult question. I don't question. know, I've never been there. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so, so let's, let's analyze the statement about the, the, it's partly cloudy. That is a claim about reality. And I think it's a true claim about reality. So what if somebody were to come along and say, it is not the case that it is partly cloudy in where we are in New Zealand right now. We would say that's a false claim because it doesn't, doesn't correspond to reality correctly. There are clouds. Look at them. Right. <laughs> now, does that imply, now we're going to get into logic here, does that imply that there is a kind of necessary relationship between something being the case and something not being the case? So it, in no possible way could it be cloudy and not cloudy. Is there any way to make sense of something like that, like a, a strict logical contradiction in that sense about reality? No, sorry, I, I, I'm not following you on this question. Okay, yeah. so we say it is true that it is partly cloudy right now. If somebody were to say it is false that it is partly cloudy right now, that would be an incorrect claim about reality. But what I want to know is, can somebody say a true statement that is contradictory. So they say, it, it is the case that it is partly cloudy, and it is not the case that it is partly cloudy. Is there any way for that type of proposition to be true? Well, I guess being, being, being cloudy, is, I suppose, is what we call, call a vague predicate, right? Mm -hmm. there, there, are, there are cases where it's definitely the case that it's cloudy, and there are cases where it's definitely not the case that it's cloudy. Mm -hmm. Like many kind of predicates, like being red, there are clear cases of red, there are clear cases of not red, there are clear, clear cases of bold people, and then there are clear cases of non-bold people, right? right? When, when we're in the partly cloudy is when we get in the fuzzy line in between. Right. And this is, for some people, this is where you actually get some kind of, um, you can actually find in people commitments to there being contradictory beliefs about that reality okay. is. Okay, so two questions about that. So now we're in the problem of vagueness. Yeah, exactly. Yes. Yeah. Okay, so two questions about that. The one, let's start with the case where it's clear cut. The person is totally bald or it's you know totally cloudy. In those kind of circumstances, yeah. would you say that it's there is no contradiction present or be impossible for there to be any contradiction present? That's I mean that would be hard, yeah. Okay. I, I don't know how Okay. Yeah. And so then let's go straight to the vague case. <laughs> let's say it is kind of partly cloudy right now. Um, so can you give some examples of how we could make sense or try to make sense of a contradictory statement? So intuitively I could think, right. you know, it is cloudy and it's not cloudy. Well, I can kind of make sense. Or he's bald and he's not bald. And I can kind of make sense of that. But they're both explicitly vague claims. It seems like if we clear up what we mean, then any kind of contradiction goes away. Okay, so I think the way they got people to hold contradictory beliefs about vague cases is, is the kind of stories where, so imagine you have like buckets of paints in front of you. So on the left hand side, they're all white. Mm -hmm. and then from each bucket, you just put a drop of red paint, right? Mm -hmm. So as you go along, you travel to the right hand side and eventually if you go far away enough, then it's all red, mm -hmm. right? So when you're very far right, it's very red and it's clear red and then on the left is white, mm -hmm. right? And the story is set up such that every time, the difference between every successive step is just one drop of paint, mm -hmm. right? So if this one is white, if you choose a bucket and you call it white, and I add one drop of paint, mm -hmm. you know, and, and my drop of paint will be small enough that you won't even be able to perceive the difference between right. the two, then you'll be committed to believing that the next one is also white, right? 
Sure. So it seems to be the case that for every successive buckets, if the left one is right, then the right one is also white. <laughs> and the first one is white. So if you follow that reasoning, then okay. you end up that all buckets are white. Okay. But obviously, at some point, there is a last white bucket and there is a first red bucket. Right. There ought to be a transition between the two, which we just don't have access to that transition. Okay. Okay, so that brings up a couple more questions. Is it the case that in reality you have this vagueness, that reality is somehow stuck in a mutually exclusive state, or is it just a statement about our knowledge of reality? That is, it seems to be a bit of an interaction between the two, because we have these predicates that try to, to, try to identify. Right? Mm -hmm. um, there's got to be a limitation to how much we can discriminate. We can't just choose a color for each single bucket, because then I'll make a continuum full of buckets, right? And there's more. There'll be more buckets and we can generate words for them. Okay. So <laughs> we'll okay. run out eventually. Okay. So, so it can't just be, you can't just resolve it by putting more, more buckets. But I guess, I guess the point is that there, there has to be a last one, but we don't know which one it is. This mm -hmm. sort of, a, 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 that's so, it is a feature of the thing. We just don't have access to which one it is. Okay. Um, some kind of ideas is when you ask people, and I think that, so, so when, when you put them in, in labs and you show them patches of color, you start from the left. And eventually, they'll choose one to, at some point, they'll just commit themselves to saying, yeah, now it's red. And then mm -hmm. you start from the right. And eventually, they'll just commit themselves to saying, yeah, now that's white. But there's an overlap between mm -hmm. the two. And a model that uh, captures this idea of overlap is that there, there ought to be a last bucket, which is white. And that means the next one has to be red, mm -hmm. but because it's a bit fuzzy in between, there's a few of those buckets at the same time. So there's a few last white buckets. Is it the case that they are fuzzy themselves, or is it the case that people have different labels? So this, uh, this color is an excellent example, because my wife and I, uh, I, she claims that I'm a little bit colorblind, it might be true, <laughs> because sometimes we disagree about We can the do it with bold people if you want. Sure, we can do that too. <laughs> Um, but could it be that what's going on here is a demonstration that what people label as white or red changes based on the person? So we might, you and I might look at you know, a flower and say, okay, that's pink. I think, yeah, that's pink. And you might say, no, I, I think that's red. So it's just a statement about how we use language rather than like an ambiguity in, in logic or in reality. Well, it's embedded in, in, in the language the same way that when we talk about truth, it's embedded in, in propositions, right? I, I, mean, okay. this, this, I mean, to say that reality is vague is, is, is maybe a miscategory in the, sense, in the same sense to say that New Zealand is true. Okay. Right? <laughs> That's not where it happens. Okay. So it's, we're trying to gather information about reality. So you would say that... So we need to split it in some kind of ways. So you would say that reality itself, reality by itself, is not contradictory. But claims about reality are irresolvable. Contradiction is when you have a proposition that is true and, fal it's true and false. So it's, it, so it's... The contradictions is, is, is about things that are truthy things. It's about the Not everything in reality is truthy. Right. Okay. So... And, and whether or not propositions are parts of reality will change how you answer that question. So is it a necessary feature of reality that it isn't contradictory? Reality, not I think it's a, it may be a miscategorization. Okay, so we can't even say that it, reality is something that could be contradictory or non-contradictory because we're just talking about language. Well, I'm not, okay, perhaps it, perhaps it adds up if you're committed to a propositions truly existing and, and being part of reality and combining it with the kind of story which I've just given where okay. some propositions have to be true and false at the same time so perhaps that's a way you can get at some kind of inconsistent reality okay if, but if maybe we take truth maybe truth isn't the right word maybe we just talk about something being the case and something not being the case could is it something about the nature of reality that it can't be the way that it is and not the way that it is <laughs> at the same time <laughs> it doesn't compute for me <laughs> It doesn't compute because it doesn't literally doesn't make sense, or it doesn't compute because the the question was not precise. So if I were to say in New Zealand, uh, you know, New Zealand 
I mean, it's, it's like if you're saying, could, could something be and not be at the same time? Yeah. Kind of thing. Right. Yeah, that, that seems nonsensical to me. Now, why? Because existence obtains or doesn't obtain in some kind of exclusive kind of way. And I, I agree with you. Um, yes. <laughs> but I want to I push it because I've encountered yes, lots of people. You're taking me into some kind of uncomfortable terrain here. And this, is, <laughs> <laughs> this is not where I thought it would go. That's, that's all right. <laughs> that's that's uh, part, of the, part of the fun. <laughs> what would you say to somebody who is claiming that, no, no, you're thinking of reality in a limited, in a limited way? You're, you're putting constraints on reality that aren't there. You're putting linguistic constraints on reality. Reality can just, doesn't really care about you calling it contradictory or being and not yeah. being. It's somehow unable to be made sense of. But in some cases, it is the case that somebody is bald and not bald themselves. And it, that's, a, that's just a contradiction in the world. What would you say to that? Go jump off a bridge, or <laughs> <laughs> gosh, I don't know. I mean, you're talking about reality as it, I, I, I don't know what reality is, and in, 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 in what we're discussing about, in a sense, like things that are, things that are. Yeah, well, this is this all makes me think about the kind of story where. You know, when we reason about truth and knowledge and beliefs and things, we're reasoning about information we have, right? So we're sort of categorizing. If you can't categorize things, then you're not getting any information, right? If everything mm. is discrete as, and non-categorized, then you just don't have any information about anything there. Okay. It's when you start agglomerating things together that you can say these things are not like those things and then that, that sort of by, by merging things together, by combining things together, by carving reality if you want, now that you start getting some kind of information that can be done in the perceptual way to a certain extent, which I suppose that's how we're sort of getting some kind of information that mm -hmm. we have in our perceptual experience of living and everything, but then when we get to talking about knowledge and truth and these kind of things, mm -hmm then we have some kind of device of categorization that treats information we have. So are you, is that a claim about like taxonomy, how we categorize things, or is that a claim about the world? So can the world be meaningfully and accurately carved up? Or is that just something that... Well, the, 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 it just is, I suppose. I mean, I... And if I were to say, I don't it know. is like and it, it isn't. I mean, it's the sort of problem that Kant had that you can't get at it. Okay. Right. Well, then, if you to, can't to get at it, we need to carve it somehow. We can't. It's it's sort of beyond us. Like as soon as we start being in this reality, we impose some kind of categorization. If 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 only by our if the kind of beings that we are, the kind of perceptual system, the, the thinking imposes a categorization on. You know, it's just it's, it's, mm -hmm. it, I don't know what it is. That, but then, <laughs> if that's true, if we yeah. can't get at it then why would we say th it has some constraint in being the way that it is? Yeah, now we're in the Kantian kind of project, of which, again, I'm <laughs> that's really far from me. <laughs> okay. Well, this is, that, was an interesting, that was an interesting line of thought. So let's take it from reality and let's talk more about language. Let's talk about tr truthy things. Truthy things, yeah, yeah. Let's keep it to truthy things. Okay. I mean, but th th it's, it's sort of... You know, a truth, a, a truth seeker will try and acquire true things. And, and, and it's sort of what I was saying about the gold digger. Like, at some point, if you, various people will make various choices as to how deep they want to understand what truth is. Mm -hmm. And you're taking these questions far beyond where, where I'm comfortable and to go mm -hmm. in public talking mm -hmm. about yeah, it that's in a kind of way. It's just that, you know, it's, it's not that they're not important questions. They're just exceedingly hard questions to, <laughs> yeah. to address, right? right? You're going super I was looking deep. for a simple answer. Yeah. <laughs> well, I mean, I don't have those. <laughs> we have simple answers to these kind of things. Philosophy wouldn't have existed for like right. this many centuries and millennia, I mean. Okay, so, so if taking it back to, <laughs> to truthy things, when I say something like, you know, I want to, this statement, there's a cup on the table, seems to be a claim that is true, 
And it is true by virtue of the fact that it is the case that in reality there seems to be a cup on the table. So there is one system which I'm very partial to and I think intuitively most people hold, which is, you could call it the classical logic system, or kind of an orthodox way of thinking. The logic of the 20th century. Logic of the 20th century, and maybe perhaps before, too. <laughs> A logic up until the 20th through 21st century. Well, that has changed so much. <laughs> right. There's so many stages in a way that it's not clear that there's even continuity from antiquity to right. the 20th century. Right. But I think what these days what people call classical logic, I mean, I'll agree with you if we mean like the kind of logics that have been developed in the 20th century. Okay. Yeah. So okay. I'm more comfortable calling it 20th century logic than classical logic. Okay, fair enough. <laughs> So the, in this way of thinking, there's a, a very visceral reaction to contradictions, to contradictory mm. claims. Yes. So could you give some explanation? I know in some of your work you have, maybe a, you're more tolerant of contradictions. Mm. Could you explain why contradictions aren't as big a deal, maybe as the classical logicians make them out to be? Yeah, so contradictions are obviously a big deal, and it's obviously important to care about them and they've always so, so that is true it has occupied philosophers and logicians since for a long time because um, I guess for a lot of people once you're committed to a contradiction um, basically you're committed to the moon is made of blue cheese like if, if there's no if it, it, it's sort of a measure of incoherence that once you have a belief that something is both true and false at the same time, mm -hmm. that basically uh, all bets are off. If you can commit yourself to something as bad as a contradiction, mm. then basically you've just trivialized. Okay. It's, it's, it's sort of like you become, I, 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 guess, I guess you kind of become an, an unreliable source of information. You kind of refute yourself in a sense. Right? Yeah, but if, if yeah. refutation is, is that, but I mean, it's, it's more that, you know, I guess, I guess in the 20th century, it, so, so inconsistency and contradiction has become the measure of um, triviality, mm -hmm. of incoherence. Because no logician wants triviality. No mm -hmm. one wants everything to be true. If right. everything is true, then, you know, what are we doing? <laughs> and nothing is true, everything is true, nothing is true. You know, it, right. it's all trivial. Like, I'm losing my time. I might as well just go play video games and right. I'll be fine with that. Mm -hmm. Like, I don't need to. So no logician want that. The question is, how do we know that, or how do we prevent ourselves from getting into a trivial system? Mm -hmm. And exactly. a common reaction is that once, is, is, is what is called the, um, the law of explosion, that everything follows from contradiction. Mm -hmm. It's this idea that once you committed yourself to contradiction, then all bets are off. Right. We don't know anymore. So I guess that's the intuition that has been driven in a lot of research in the 20s century and overall in history as well in mathematics just making sure that we don't uh, end up in contradiction mm -hmm. whether or not it is so that I guess that rule of explosion has become the measure of triviality mm -hmm. right and that comes in conflict with other kinds of notions that people have been interested about so okay. truth is one of them for instance so coming back to truth let's forget about reality let's just talk about truth okay. as if we <laughs> sort of understood how it matches up to reality or anything. <laughs> but there is sort of the dream. Think of it as a dream that you're going to, that we're going to, truth is that kind of thing that's going to carve the universe between, you know, there's the true things and the false things. Mm -hmm. And I'm just going to like throw a lasso in the universe and I'm going to pull it. And what I'm going to pull back is only, all and only the true things. Okay. Right? So that's, you can think of it as Starsky's dream if you want. That would be a truth predicate. So okay. something will be in my, in my col in, in the collection I've just had or in my bag, only if it's true and all the true things will be in there. Mm -hmm. And what okay. Tarski showed us is that you can't do that because your bag will also have false things in there. Okay. Right? Because as soon as you try, the lasso itself is an, it will, will also return false things. That's the liar sentence. Because mm -hmm. if you have a predicate that says, um, a, a truth predicate, so a truth predicate would be a predicate that applies to propositions and, you know, it applies to the proposition when the proposition is true. Mm -hmm. thing. Very simple, it just says this proposition is true as we're talking about it. But it's isolating, isolating this is true things as a predicate mm -hmm. that could be used in propositions. Okay. Once you can do that, you can create the liar sentence. The liar sentence is a sentence that says of itself, 
that it is false, mm -hmm. right? So is the liar sentence true? Well, if it's true, then what it says is true. What it says is that it's false, and so it's false, right? So it's false. Well, if it's false, then what it says is, is, is false, and what it says is of itself uh, that is false, so it's true. Right. Right. So you end up in that contradiction. Right. Right. So if you, so holding that dream that you can return all and only the true propositions mm -hmm. leads you to an inconsistency. Okay. So before we move on, yeah. are there any other uh, sentences like the liar sentence which the lasso brings back, or is it just the liar sentence? The true sentence will uh, bring back that one. Th th it may have some companion ones and then a pair of. That a contradictory? Probably. Yeah, I don't know right off the top of my head. But okay. Uh, but we can maybe we can revisit that. Yeah. Um, so, we've got the lasso. We the idea is we want to only get the true things and have all the and system. All and only. All and only exactly. Yes. But in that particular system, we get this anomaly: the liar sentence. This sentence is false. Well, it's true. But if it's true, it's false. If it's false, it's true. It's a contradiction. Now what? Well, now the 20th century, the 20th century logician says, contradiction, warning, triviality, now I have a trivial theory, and therefore I back away. Right. Go away from contradictions, the lesu does not exist. Right? Okay. So that's, <laughs> that has been the reaction. Okay, so there's no truth predicate. <laughs> okay. Right? That seems like an extreme reaction. It, it's well <laughs> said in that way. So I, maybe I've geared the story so okay. as to get okay. as an extreme reaction, but that's sort of what has happened. Okay. That we said, okay, so that was a that was a great dream, but that dream can't happen because it leads to inconsistency. So you can think of twentieth century logicians as going on the shoot. So okay, we'll just make sure that we're not gonna get all truth, but we're only gonna get truth. Right? Okay. Fair so enough. we're gonna we're gonna restrict our analysis such that we're going to take a smaller lasso kind of thing. It's just going to, mm -hmm. what it brings back, we're, we're just going to make sure that they're true and only true kind of things. Okay. So they're on the shooting, right? Okay. Well, to preserve consistency. To preserve consistency because okay. consistency would be, it, is important. Right. But to a certain extent, it kind of changes what we thought was truth, mm -hmm. right? Well, cha changing here, but you know, we thought we had that notion of truth capturing, you know, truth being right. these kind of things. Now we have to revise what we mean by truth. Okay. That's okay. And that has been done and a lot of people have done so. And there's various stories, more or less plausible. And, you know, it, it's all good. It's fine. It's, it's glorious philosophy. And it's, it's beautiful. Like, it's fine. But an alternative reaction is you say, okay, I'm going to do the opposite. I don't want to miss out any truths, but I'm going to accept that some of them will also be false. So you overshoot. Okay. Right? So that would be, a, so that's where you say, okay, the logs, the, so you're going to say the logs uh, explosion is no longer valid. Okay. That uh, inconsistencies is no longer a measure of triviality. Right? So you're going to say, okay, I, I want to keep my lasso, but my lasso has this, this funny feature that for some sentences it returns some that are both true and false. So okay. I need to make sure that I don't trivialize because of that. And how do I, how do I keep all truths, right, and not trivialize? And so that all is, truths and then some, and, and then some. Some some of them will okay. be false. And and so okay. that's a way of thinking about dialectic logic. So yeah. that's a logic that accepts that there are contradictions, and so you have always a but kind of clause. Cool. You know, all tautologies are true, some are also false. <laughs> you know, the, the truth predicates only return true formulas. Some are also false. There's always a but clause kind of thing. Okay, but doesn't <laughs> doesn't that kind of deflate the notion of truth though? When we say we're going to say some things are true, or we're going to say in this lasso got all truths, but some of them are false and true. Yes. Right? Doesn't that kind of def doesn't that defeat the the idea of what we mean by true? Is that they're not false? Well, we got all the truth. We wanted all the truth. Yeah, but it, okay. So, but it's, okay. it, it, what, 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 what is, it, it doesn't make the game easy. It makes the game a lot harder. You're saying? We, it makes the game a lot harder because we don't want to trivialize either, right? It's not like all of a sudden we're saying, oh, contradictions are fine. I right. can't, we can't right. be saying that all contradictions are true. Okay. Right? If all contradictions are true, then everything is true, right? But. It, it, right? It, um, if all contradictions are true, then everything is true. 
what I would say, you could say that, but I would kind of go one step below that. I would say then truth is meaningless because what's there seems to be this polarity between sure, sure, what sure. we mean okay, by sure. true and I, false. I, sure, okay. I, th I think I can go with, with you on that. Okay. Now. Right. So I don't want my lawsuit to return everything because like truth has just gone out. Right. Like it's now it would be genuinely meaningless. Meaningless. So yeah. that would be unusable because we'd have some kind of trivial, you know, would be trivial. So forget about truth. Right. right. No, so, but I don't, yes, so we agree with that, and most people that are in these kind of projects to like overshoot mm -hmm. will then try to find me different kind of measures just to make sure that we don't trivialize. So we need some kind of new measures that will tell us which contradictions are acceptable and which aren't. Okay. But so we can't only rely on contradictions anymore because inconsistency is no longer the measure. Okay, so that's, that I got several really important questions, but yeah. let's go on that, <laughs> uh, just on that thread by what what are those other measures? So if we say contradiction is no longer the standard, what are the other ones? Okay, well, for logicians, there's been uh, attempts at pr non-triviality proofs is something that also, of course, has occupied um, uh, 20th century logicians uh, from Hilbert uh, to Gödel, for instance. Like They wanted to make sure that they could prove that they had some kind of consistency. Mm -hmm. Right? Gödel showed us, well, forget about it, right? We can only get relative consistency proof, as in, if you have a stronger theory that is consistent, then you can show that your smaller theory is also consistent, but then you're at the top, right? Now with Gödel, is that, um, correct me if I'm wrong, but there's a very strong correlate between the Gödel sentence and the liar's paradox, right? Uh, they're in the same ball. Park. Uh, right. I, yeah, it's the same kind of feature. Uh, the problem with Gödel's sentence is more that it's it's not as it's, it depends how you react to it. I think I think like the, the, the Tarski sentence gives you a contradiction immediately. Gödel's sentence is more is a sentence that says if it's true, I'm not provable. Right. And it's just a it, it, it's it's it, the it, self-reference idea that it comes yeah, from self-reference. So the self-reference is is there in both. Right. But it's used in different kind of ways. We well, said the Tarski sentence. What is that sentence? Oh, the liar sentence. Oh, the liar sentence. Yeah. Oh, okay. Um, yeah. Why do I go on about all this? Is that it was okay? So I, I guess like what Gödel showed is that Hilbert's idea of showing that mathematics was consistent is probably unachievable, hmm. right? So 20th century logicians are in, are in no better position to tell us that their theory um, is is non-trivial, if, if it's rich enough. But there is this idea of relative consistency, right? Mm -hmm. So you can, all, all I want to say is that there, have, there, there are ways, for instance, Kripke showed that about the liar sentence, that you can construct models in which you have these inconsistencies, and so you, can con you, you, you get relative non-triviality proofs. Okay. So um, people that are interested in having the, the big lasso have found measures and systems for which they claim they have proof that you don't return everything. Okay. Right? Ca so there is a sense in which everybody is in the okay. same boat here. In, in terms of wanting to avoid universal contradiction? Yes, or okay. triviality. Or triviality. Yeah. Okay. So I, I don't think anybody is in a better, is, 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 has a privileged position yet. Okay. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So let me ask you. Um, <laughs> Before we go back to contradiction about mathematics, you said 20th century, the project of putting 20th century mathematics as being this perfectly consistent thing, you think that's, that project is, is toast? People are still trying to do that. Um, it's not entirely toast, but what counts as a proof of consistency had to be revisited. Mm -hmm. And uh, from what, I, I, again, you need to go talk to some proof theorists mm -hmm. and that probably you know, travel to somewhere in America or Germany or somewhere, <laughs> where you'll find proof theorists talking about it. It's just that what uh, we take to be a, a consistency proof has to be adapted in ways that will not fall for Gödel's, uh, Gödel's okay. thing. So, so the, the mathematics that they use to prove consistency itself becomes exceedingly complex. Would you say that this is a fair analogy or, or a, fail, a, a fair analysis of the two areas? In in logic and in mathematics, that in the system of logic, in the classical logic, <clears throat> our systems, even if they're complex and intricate and detailed and beautiful and powerful, 
are always going to contain in the system of logic itself an inescapable contradiction, at least one. Not all of them, no. Not all of them. Not all of them. There are some. It depends how complex it gets. Right? Okay. Okay. What about what about just? Uh, so you take, for instance, I don't know, uh, propositional logic. Yeah. Yeah, that's fine. Okay. You know, twentieth century propositional logic. You know, we have consistency proof for that. We're okay. Fine. Okay. Because it and and it, it's not expressive enough to be able to. It's not self-referential. Okay. Right. So you need to. You need to throw in it. You need to throw in more expressivity, so quantifiers, and then you start adding it enough rules so that it can start like doing some mathematics. You need to be able to do enough. So it's when you get so when you add the when you add more um, horsepower yes. to yeah. your logic. Yes. That gives you the ability to make meaningful self-reference. Yes. That's when you. That's when we say, okay, now that system has at least one. Okay, so that, that, uh, it's, uh, I think you can have enough horsepower that you have self-reference without having inconsistencies that can probably be built up. Okay. It depends what horsepower you throw in. Okay, so for instance, with yeah. Tarski, if you throw in the truth predicate, then, you, then you're in trouble. Okay. Right? Because of Tarski's argument. But that doesn't mean it's the only way to get you. At can you explain that more, the Tarski's argument? Uh, that was the liar sentence that I said. So if you have, if you throw in a truth predicate, then you can say, and and you have enough self-reference, then then you can generate a sentence that says of itself that it's true if and only if it's false, basically. Right. So then you get that contradiction. Okay. But um, there's various pieces. There's you, you need enough horsepower to generate that sentence. Okay. But you don't need to, you know. So if, if you're missing a bit, then you won't be able to generate that sentence. Sometimes. You know, there's various ways of like, it's when when you produce the argument, when you run it all like in all its glory details, mm -hmm. there's various widgets and bits and pieces mm -hmm. that you put there, and there's various bits and pieces and widgets that you can remove from the engine okay. that will keep you safe. Okay. Right? So that has been a lot of that has been various kinds of strategies that people have adopted. Okay. So then the question would be, why would it be necessary? To expand the logic outside of propositional logic, outside of this beautiful system that contains no no contradictions, why would we even? Because you're missing out on validities. So if you okay. only have propositional logic, you can't even get good old syllogisms like uh, from antiquity. Or, uh, uh, you know, all humans are mortal. Sophie is human, therefore Sophie is mortal. Okay. Right. So if if you only have propositional logic, then you can't you can't get at the validity the validity of that. Okay. Right, because because all humans are mortal has a quantifier in there. Mm -hmm. but if you don't have the quantifier, only you can only translate it as p. Okay. So you get p, <laughs> and then you get Sophie is mortal. Well, you can't. You don't have names to talk about Sophie, right. so that's just q. Right. And the conclusion, you know, is r. Okay. And you can't get r from p and q, so that comes out as invalid. Okay. So. So we're missing out on validities. So that's why we need to throw in some quantifiers. We're missing out on validities for. Those propositions which include quantifiers, yeah. right? So you can still have yeah, yeah, validities yeah, yeah. in yes. the propositional logic, yes, but yes. not those that when you're talking yes, about yeah, all. Yeah, so yeah, yeah, what, yeah, yeah. what would you think about this idea? That what we've demonstrated is if we're talking about sentences where you include quantifiers like the word all, that when you discover a contradiction, or do you discover that that system in itself is inconsistent because it has at least one contradiction wouldn't we say oh well that's a problem with quantifiers so wouldn't wouldn't we want to throw out the quantifiers and say oh, well we can't actually use language like all bachelors are married or whatever right yeah but we do right I mean that, that, <laughs> that's the thing like some, some people have said okay truth is truth is not a predicate but we use it as a predicate, and it works just fine, doesn't it? Like well, but it's truth as a predicate. <laughs> with quantifiers, I don't know. So, with, I, with I, the think, I, th I think what you're after is something. You, there's something very interesting in what you're saying there, though, because obviously, for logicians anyway, and logicians that like to devise these languages, these languages that are only truthy, right? Mm -hmm. Back to the languages that we were talking about mm -hmm. earlier. There's a child. There's a choice as to the control you can have in terms of like controlling inconsistency and triviality and how much uh, expressivity it will give you into sort of trying to understand valid inferences and mm -hmm. truthy kind of things that you're kind of after, right? Mm -hmm. 
So if you so as we said, like when we when we stay at propositional propositional logic, we're cool. The problem is that we're missing out on valid arguments that we'd like to have, right? So we start putting th there's a trade-off, right? Mm -hmm. So um, so we add the quantifiers, and then we're still cool. So long as we only have the quantifiers, now we got this argument that we wanted. Right. But then we're missing out on some valid argument in mathematics. And so now we start throwing in some widgets to get at some mathematics, and then Gödel shows up. So let me ask you this, right? right? Because this is, this is an excellent way to frame it. As we start going higher and higher, is the reason that we're going higher and higher not because of everyday language we want to say things about the world, but because of math, essentially. You could, you could, math is one of the motivations that eventually y you'd want to get at, but it, you know, like the first argument we had the syllogism about mm -hmm. Sophia being mortal is not math, it's just pure reasoning. It's mm -hmm. the kind of reasoning that you and I use. Another way of thinking about climbing this ladder mm -hmm. is think about in, in, in a naive kind of way, so I, but just as an analogy, think, think about artificial intelligence, right? Mm -hmm. If all a little robot had was propositional logic, it would definitely fail to be as intelligent and seeing so, right. so much validity as we do, right? So we, right. we throw it a bit more, we give it quantifiers, yeah. right? And then so how, how would the robot with, the, with standard logic when we're talking about you <laughs> know, all X or Y, that yeah. we can say that. How, what would it react, how would it react to well, the logic? Well, probably that, that's, that, that, that gets already problematic because that kind of logic is undecidable. So th there's various problems. The, the more you give it expressive power, the less okay. control you have on, 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 on helping it make an inferences in some kind of regulated way. But right? doesn't it seem like that would be a statement about some kind of flaw about expressivity? That it's like the more you, if you want to say more and more and more, eventually you say, you can say so much that it includes contradictions. Is, uh, is that a flaw? Is that just what it's all about? Like, mm -hmm. You know, if, if anything, English, the kind of language, language that you and I are using at the moment, has, has all these things that we can express the, the, the liar sentence and we can express all these kind of things, right? Once we start developing language and using them for reasoning and for trying to get at truth and validity mm -hmm. and things like that, well, the tools that we're using can hurt us too, right? <laughs> okay. <laughs> All right. So, 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 so it's, it's, it's always trying to find the right balance between how you're going to express, how you're getting at truth, and the tools that you're using, and how much control you have on the tools that you're using. Right. And another way I like to think about it is sometimes you go in different departments. In economics, for instance, they want to make predictions about I don't know, markets and things like mm -hmm. that, right? And there's no columns on, on, on the mathematics that they're going to use. All mathematics goes so long as I can get the right kind of predictions for my, for, for my market, and that, mm -hmm. that's fine. But so they will help th themselves to any bits of language and mathematics that will give them the, mm -hmm. the proper kind of analysis. It's, I don't mean by that it's arbitrary, but they're not in the business of trying to isolate a language that can control. Right. Like, you know, so they want to be as expressive as they can because what they care about is the predictions that they're making. Right, right. So they don't need to like take all that super powerful baggage that they're using and put <laughs> it in a little machine right. that can control it. Right. Logicians and well, some logicians, more like the computer science kind of, would you know, there is that project of trying to find some kind of language that will isolate valid inferences, the mm -hmm. lasso that isolates truth, like these kind of ideas. Can we formalize these things that get at truth? Okay. And, and now we get into the problems of how expressive these languages can be. Okay. Right? So... Does that make sense? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Let's revisit, if we can, the liar's sentence, because I find this a really interesting and apparently very high, very high stakes, right? It, it says something, if we can't grapple with the liar sentence in if we can't just dismiss the liar sentence essentially we're forced to uh, revise logic in a sense is that fair we're forced to find logics that can cope right with the consequences of having the liar sentence in the logic basically okay so i don't know if it's a revision but yeah or an expansion it limits, maybe well it it it, it it forces us to make some decision as to what kind of logic we can use, basically. Okay. Right? So let's let's go and analyze the liar sentence. So 
when th this sentence is false, when we say hey, this is a true contradiction and it's true and false at the same time, this is something, would you say that that's a, a violation of the law of identity, the old Aristotelian A is A, and maybe the law of non-contradiction, right, obviously? I don't think so. You don't think so? I don't think so. So would you think that the law of non-contradiction can be violated and you can still preserve the law of identity? Yes. Okay, can yes. you explain that? Because, so for, for intuitively, when we say something like, when we, has, uh, we use the term not A versus A, it seems like the whole meaning of what not is, is a negation of A. It's like yes. That's the whole reason we come up with the concept, is like not means a big X over it, like yes. absolutely not, which seems in, in, incompatible with A, the whole point of A, right? I, th I think I'd like to, is, is your question something like, I think, I think the intuition you're getting at is that true, what is true and what is false are mutually exclusive. Yeah. Right? Sure. Right. And the liar just like goes, has a, has a foot in both. Okay. Right? So, is the, so I guess <laughs> the question that I have for you is how are we to make sense of true, what that means, if we're saying, in at least one circumstance, what can be, what is true is false. Because in the way that I'm conceiving of truth and falsehood, I would say, by definition, is mutually exclusive. That's the, the right, meaning that, of the Right, but that word. was the dream of the lasso. Right. Yeah. And that dream won't, and if you want to have the lasso, then that lasso is an inconsistent thing. Or the lasso does not exist. <laughs> right? That, but that, that, but that, how, that, is, that is the dilemma, right? But how do you make sense of it? So how do you make sense of the concept of true when it encompasses not true. In some cases. It's just that cases, truth yeah. and falsity are not mutually exclusive. That's how I'm, I mean... <laughs> <laughs> but that's the sentence, but how do you make... So I'm saying, okay, I'm there. I'm like, I'm at the doorstep. Yep, okay. What does that mean? How can I make sense of that? I, I understand the perspective we have to accept it. But I say, okay, let's accept it. Let's act at least like we accept it. But how do I make sense of it now? Or can it be made sense of? I don't want to answer the question directly. So, do you know, do you know about David Lewis and his um, idea of modal realism? Mm -mm. So he's committed to the existence of other possible worlds. Okay. So he does modal logic and he talks about counterfactuals, and he basically, in his in his picture of in his in his metaphysical picture, there are infinitely many possible worlds and all these worlds are sort of causally independent entities and the full stories of everything so okay. we are in the possible worlds and there are other possible worlds the way this world could have been so mm -hmm. you know there could be three people in this room there could be four people in this room there could be nobody in this room and, you know so mm -hmm. each of those is a different l okay. is, so it's like right. a multiverse theory so it's, uh, of. sort of it's, yeah. it's the same kind of story anyway the point is that he's defended the view that uh, that these worlds exist just as much as others. And mm -hmm. people have said exactly what I you're saying. I have heard this argument, but I didn't know the name. <laughs> yeah, okay, so it's called modal realism. Um, I, I'm, I'm, not, I, I'm, I'm not getting into this to rehearse the argument. Sure. I think the point is that people, to him, had the same kind of reaction, just this kind of incredulous look. <laughs> what do you mean? I can't make sense of other possible worlds existing like ours. Okay. To which you would say, sure. Me neither. That doesn't mean it's not the best explanation of what I'm after. Well, I can make sense of that to say, I mean, that we would incorporate something like the, the multiverse theory. That I don't think this is necessarily the case, but I can, I can at least okay, imagine so a consistent way to say there is this universe, there is another universe, these two universes are not the same. What we mean by a possible universe is simply a kind of a descriptor of that other universe. Yeah, no, so, but, uh, so I think that's not exactly the right kind of analogy because okay. a multi if, if we live in a multiverse, then that's one possible world because we could live in a different multiverse. So it kind of depends on where you carve the boundaries. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So, okay, so he's saying so it's, it's outside the boundaries. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's, it's okay, now that I can't make sense of it. <laughs> see, what, see what I mean? Okay. So, you, so, so, but that's the, that's the same kind of thing. With, at some point, once you start exploring these kind of ideas, mm -hmm. yeah, it's incredulous. And I sort of, yeah, I'm, I'm still a bit there with you as when I contemplate the liar sentence. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it is. It's hard to make sense of it. A aside from just like repeating it, yeah, it's true. 
Uh, so it's false, yeah. So it's false, yeah, and it's true. And then you just keep on going, and eventually you just stop worrying too much about the fact that this sentence is incredulous because you have other motivation okay. around it for dealing with these kinds of systems. Okay. Right? So th the idea is, I mean... So w could, would you say something like this then, that <laughs> it is not the case that truth is absolute in the sense that we have to accept in our conception of what truth means that you bump up into the incredulous sentences and that's just the nature of the game. Yeah, if, if, you, yeah, if you dig far enough with any kinds of concept, if you dig far enough you might reach boundaries in which you see incredulous things. And <laughs> when these things are, th you know, and, and what to do with them. Right. Of course, that's when it becomes all fascinating, right? It's, it's, it's not that they were wrong in the 20th century to say, oh my God, go away. There's no truth predicate. <laughs> that, that, that's perfectly fine. And in, in, in like, like against mono realists, some people will say, well, there are no possible words. That makes no sense. Go away. Kind of thing. That's fine. <laughs> I mean, what do you do with the incredulous things when you meet them? That's when all the fun begins, isn't it? Like My suspicion, though, is to think <laughs> if we run into something like that, we've made an error. There's a, there's some, it's a, it's a, if we, if we hit the, the contradiction, I guess, is a good marker of it. That, okay, we've made a mistake. Where is the mistake? Rather than throwing out this idea of the consistency of truth, the absoluteness of truth, we say, okay, there's got to be some funny business going on with the liar sentence. Yep. If, if once you started traveling towards the liar sentence, you had, a, a, you had some kind of conception of truth and logic that once they've reached the liar sentence, trivialize, right? Well, not necessarily. So you, I mean, what I'm saying is you hit that contradiction, and then if your logic is explosive and you have a contradiction, then there you go, you're trivial. Well, right? so that's an excellent way of putting it. You have a theory of truth, and of logic, which says, in some circumstances, I can accept a contradiction. Things don't explode. <laughs> yes. I have a theory of truth which says, when you bump into a contradiction, it's a demonstration that there's some funny business going on. Now, when we're the benefit that I have, I think, going for in my conception of truth and logic, and this is what I want to hear your input on is I can say when you analyze truth, when you get down to it, when you, when you put that, uh, when you push it as far as it can go, truth still has an absolute meaning. So I can say the, the way that the truth has meaning to me because in all circumstances it is mutually exclusive with falsehood. But it sounds like you're saying your conception of truth and logic you aren't able to do that. And for my, I'm sure a lot of people, especially if they're unfamiliar with these ideas, would say, mm. oh, well, if we're going to choose one of the two ways of thinking about truth and logic, let's do the one that, does, that allows you to retain this mutual exclusivity of true and false. How would you respond to that? That, that is fine. But that, <laughs> is, that, is some, that is basically one of the first questions you've asked me. What's truth? Right. Right? I mean, both of us and any one of us that reaches these, when we reach these things, like we have to make choices, like, sure, so you want to preserve some kind of conception of truth that doesn't lead us to that contradiction. Mm -hmm. Okay, mm -hmm. and people have devised systems about it, but these systems oftentimes, okay, oftentimes what happened is that to preserve consistency, they, they it, I don't mean it in a diminishing way about, uh, about the philosophy. What seems to happen is that people start throwing epicycles at their theories, basically. <laughs> That's a great way of putting it. So, so, so you, you end up way? with a whole lot of epicycles. Right. So, yeah, so you, but the thing is, so you need an epicycles to account for that, and then what about this, and then you need another epicycles. So people, I want to make sure that people understand what you're saying. Yes. The epicycle is the idea in the Ptolemaic model of the solar system where you instead of the theory that says that, you know the earth is revolving the earth is not stationary yes. with the stars revolving around it yes. the way that they accounted for the motion of the stars is this it's funny looking at it now but they have these 
you know, they're in beautiful circles, and then in one part of the circle there's this little squiggle. It just kind of reverses course, and then it goes back, and they do that to try to preserve the explanatory yes. power. But and, at the end of the day... And they had really, really good prediction about, really good uh, about the, uh, the, the movement of the stars in the sky, right. and they had, uh, Ptolemy actually had fewer epicycles than Copernicus. Okay. Did you know that? I didn't know that. Because Copernicus put the, center, uh, the sun in the center, but he still had the orbits being circles. And um, it's only okay. afterwards that we had the, um, what's the name, ellipse? Yeah, the ellipses. The yeah. ellipses. Uh, that then we removed all the epicycles. Okay. But anyway. So it's like unnecessary theoretical clutter. Yes. That's probably a demonstration yes. of, the, of, a, of the shallowness of the theory, yes. you might say. And so there is a sense, th it's, it's a great analogy to, to work with anyway, mm -hmm. because there is a sense in which both the Ptolemaic and the um, Copern Copernicus system got at the same predictions, but one had, well, take the, with the ellipses, so the one that has no epicycles and the other one that has, and mm -hmm. they sort of get at the same kind of predictions, mm -hmm. they probably don't agree on everything, but mm -hmm. mostly they agree together, which right. is best. Right. Right. So there is these kinds of questions that, so by analogy, I find that reading some of the 20th century philosophy that tries to preserve consistency mm -hmm. that they're just throwing a whole lot of epicycles and they built what I call classical monsters mm -hmm. of truth. It's just that it, mm. it all, almost feels like you end up with some kind of ad hoc theory mm -hmm. or patchwork. Mm -hmm. it, it works, but there's a lot of duct tape on it. Now could you, could you go into <laughs> a little bit more detail because the, I'm ignorant on this. This is an interesting, really interesting claim. Um, what are the epicycles? What are the claims so let's let's take for granted. Let, let's just say let's mm. assume the Lyers paradox is resolved. I mean, let's say we have a satisfactory resolution for that. What are the other what are the other parts of the monster? So I guess for someone who meets the contradiction and wants to pre to, to keep a logic that has the law of explosion, so that in in which the measure of triviality is consistency, then mm -hmm. one has to uh, fit all or wants to one needs a correspond a notion of truth that mm -hmm. will not generate a contradiction because then the, the combination will make them trivial. So uh, th there are several strategies, common kind of strategies is to start stratifying levels. So you talk about truth at level zero and then, and then you can have a truth predicate at th that is at level one and the truth predicate of level one only talks about truth at level zero. Mm -hmm. and then what about truth of level one? Well those you can capture with the predicate that is at level two. Okay. And then you keep climbing, climbing, climbing and then you take the infinite union. So that was a kind of strategy that Kripke used for instance. Okay. But this idea that there's levels of truth, it preserved the consistency mm -hmm. but now I would be the one to ask like, but that doesn't make sense to me. How, how is that true? Now this, I have a vague memory of Bertrand Russell trying to do something similar. Exactly, with the type language. theory. For yeah. to, that's the same kind of strategy right. that uh, Bertrand Russell, uh, the, the type theory to deal with Russell, um, the Russell set. Right. So the Russell set from memory is the set that contains all the set that are not members of themselves. Right, exactly. You know, if you repeat that every night after a couple of years, like it, you can <laughs> <laughs> that's the Russell set, you can drop it in an interview. Um, some kind of problem, so what they started doing is, okay, and so there's sets of levels, well, there's just items in the bottom, and then there's, you know, sets of those items, and then there's sets of those sets, and then sets of those sets, mm -hmm. and then you just keep climbing up. Mm -hmm. And so that's one way, but then this, you know, this is a way to sort of stratify your concepts so as to preserve consistency. Right. But, you know, you, you get problems because then you can start asking questions about the, the collection of all those together. What right. about that? Right. right. So that's one way. Another way, so recently I was reading a paper and the strategy was to divide the concept of truth into what was called an ascending truth and a descending truth. So uh, we need to come back to uh, what, um, to, uh, what's, what's that called? From Tarski, so uh, from Tarski there's this biconditional that P is true. No, P if and only if P is true. Mm -hmm. uh, I've heard that in your interview, for instance, with Williamson, you've talked about that <laughs> biconditional, right? A little bit. So that means if P, then we can get that P is true. Right. And if we have that P is true, then we can get that P, right? Mm -hmm. So that's a biconditional that goes in, in two ways. Now split that, you know, call from P to T of P, call that ascending truth. 
and call from T of P to P descending truth. Okay. So you've, you've sort of split your notion of mm -hmm. truth into ascending and descending truth. And then you can modularize and control each of these levels independently. Right? Okay. So, and once you do that, then, um, so then, then, then you can show that you're not generating the uh, contradiction that then trivializes under explosion. Okay. But now, what is ascending and descending truth? And stories have been given. I mean, th these are very interesting stories. Mm -hmm. But the point is, you know, because, because the combination of truth and logic leads to the triviality, changing one or the other will, will have consequences and commitments that mm -hmm. are not palatable for people of each camp. Okay. Some, everyone has to do something about it. So what about, <laughs> instead of the ascending or descending truth, what about, if I were to say, this is again a part of my own belief system, what about saying that the, the error and the liar's paradox is more about language, it's more about a function of language, that, that if we're talking about this sentence is false, this sentence doesn't actually refer to anything. So it is either the case that, I put it this way, this is the way that I like to put it. It is either the case that this sentence refers to this sentence is false, the whole thing, or this sentence is the thing being analyzed as true or false. So it's th like this sentence in parentheses is true, or this sentence is false. Right? Those are the, one of the only two options. Right? Mm. If it's the latter option, then it's neither true or false, because this sentence is just two words. There's nothing, you're not, you're not making a proposition, you're just saying true or false. And the first one, this sentence, if what this sentence is, is this sentence is false, then you run into an infinite regress. Because what the liar's paradox would actually be is, this sentence is false, is false. And then you say, okay, let's analyze what this sentence is. It's this sentence is false, which means it's this sentence is false, is false, is false. So it seems yeah. to me that you're challenging the uh, self-reference, the self re you're challenging one whether or not of self we can make yeah. sense of that self-reference. In, in some circumstances, yes. You could have self-reference in this thing that I can, I can talk right. about myself, but when right. language is talking about itself in the process of the sentence being spoken, it seems like there's a, an error yeah. there. So then, okay, so I guess... So in that particular attempt to resolve the liar's paradox, to try to work through the logic without contradiction, do you, do you find that uncompelling well, if you want to get into the study of the liar sentence in great detail, that is a fascinating subject, and it has a long history. It goes back all the way to antiquity, but in the modern form, it comes from a, tar a paper by Tarski, I think, in the 40s. And there's several attempts and responses and confusion, and there's it's a huge debate. And I think that would make like an excellent topic for you to follow up on this, like mm -hmm. just to take on the liar sentence itself and do, you know go deep with it with, right. with some expert on thing. I think that would that would be a really nice podcast for you. Yeah, I think uh, I think I'll take you up on that. I know I've I've spoken a little bit to a few people about it, but it's never I never have spent an entire episode just focusing on the liar's paradox. It is a big one, and it will be a really interesting one. Well, I think that's a, I think that's a great way to, to wrap up. That kind of gives me my next uh, the next step in the journey where I need to go. I really appreciate the conversation, talking about contradictions and logic. This has been awesome. I've had a really good time, and I really appreciate you coming all the way here in New Zealand to talk about this. So uh, I wish you the best with your follow-up interviews and everything you're doing in this project. It seems really cool. Cheers. Thank you. All right, that was my conversation with Dr. Patrick Girard. Hope you guys enjoyed it. I probably could have spoken with him for another two or three hours just on this topic. And of course, as always, there's lots more to say. I really can't wait to find somebody who specializes exactly in the liar's paradox because whether or not we can resolve that particular apparent contradiction, I think has huge implications. If we can, I think it has huge implications if we can't. If you'd like to know more about my position on the topic of logic and contradictions, that is the subject of my book, Square One, which you can pick up on Amazon immediately. That's all for today. Thanks for listening, and enjoy the rest of your day.